Hello and welcome to the show. I'm Martin Willis, your host. And we have a, I think we have a great show tonight. We It's packed full. We have Avi Loeb coming up. Uh, we have my friend Mark D'Antonio. I'm actually going to bring them both on together uh, because we're going to be talking about the Galileo Project. I'm pretty excited about talking about that. And uh, we can all help with this too. This is uh, something I was alerted um, from. I was on a podcast a while back, the Basement Hangout with some real fun guys. I suggest anyone uh, check that out. They do a lot of UFO things, uh, Chad and Bob over there. And they said, hey, Avi's just set up this funding where anybody can fund because it's real tricky when it comes to Harvard. Funding Harvard it has to be a $50,000 donor or above and they have to be vetted. Um, but there's a kind of a workaround that I'm gonna be talking to Avi about that where anyone can pitch in. And I plan to, and I hope uh, I hope more people can help because we're going to talk a little bit about that and the process of what Avi is trying to do. Um, so I also have Chad Rowe uh, coming in as well, and he's going to be talking about some interesting things with uh, NASA and, uh, well, actually, um, aeronautics uh, research and aviation research in the UAP, taking it scientifically more on that. So um, I also, I do want to say that, uh, Last week, I had a guest on and I was talking about uh, working with a really good friend of mine and how he's an antique guy and he works like crazy. Anyway, uh, another friend of mine who actually works with him sent me a text and I want to give a shout out to Dalton Meter. Um, Dan Meter, a good friend of mine, works like crazy too. And he, he was listening in Atlanta and he said, that sounds just like my uncle. Dan, I wonder if he's talking about Dan. So he texts his uncle and said, I, do you happen to know, know a guy named Martin Willis? And I've, Dan and I have known each other for years. Anyway, little shout out to him. It's kind of funny how, uh, uh, you know, one thing, antiques and UFOs somehow goes together sometimes. I don't know exactly why. Ancient aliens, maybe? I don't know uh, what that's about. But anyway, uh, the blog written by Charles Lear as every week is a UFO flap in Virginia, 1965. And uh, that's another fascinating one. Remember, all these go into audio blogs uh, about the end of the week or first of the next week. Uh, he's a real busy guy. He just moved back across country to New York, and he's still writing these blogs and doing the audio blogs. And thank you for that, Charles. So um, I think I want to jump right in and bring our guest, uh, Avi Loeb, Harvard, Avi Loeb, in to talk about the Galileo Project. And also, Mark, how are you guys? Thanks for having us. Likewise, yeah. Yeah, Avi, you have done 1,100 interviews. <laughs> and you were on, you were on with, I was on the same podcast the week before with Chad and Bob. Uh, really fun, fun guys. And they, they were hilarious talking to you. They dared to ask really silly questions like, is, is Bigfoot next? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I don't think there are silly questions. Well, uh, usually there yeah. are silly answers. But, uh, yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah. But um, one of the things I, I know it was a while since you were on, but one of the things I really, really like your approach because um, it's how all things really are created in the world. If you think about it, you have to act like a child with an imagination. And I was watching something on the creative brain. It was called something like that, a documentary and how people have to think so outside of the box. And uh, one of the architects there said, hey, you know, picture the Empire State Building. Just picture it. It's always been there as far as we know, you know, but someone had to think that up. Someone had to think that design up. You know, it always starts from a thought. Everything starts from a thought right. and imagination. And some, you know, some defenders of science are actually hurting it because they're not paying attention to unusual evidence and unconventional ideas eventually become conventional. Look at the, the lab leak theory about COVID. You know, a year ago, it was laughed at. And now the Biden administration is about to get a report uh, any minute uh, about it. There's a serious matter. And uh, it just illustrates that we should be guided by evidence. We should keep our eyes on the ball, not on the audience. Right. And uh, I, I heard you say that on their podcast. I'm wearing Neil uh, deGrasse Tyson's shirt. It's all stardust. A very good close friend of mine gave this to me. But um, And I heard what you said. Um, and, and I've, I've given him a little bit of criticism because of the way he treats the UFO topic uh, with um, such ridicule. And basically, um, I like what you said. You said 
he is addressing an audience, not science. Right. He cares a lot about the number of likes he gets on Twitter. And the yeah. point is that, um, you know, that's not the way science should be guided. Science should be guided by evidence. And, you know, especially when you see something unusual, it should be intriguing. You should be excited by it rather than ridiculing it because you want to stay in your comfort zone. That's the wrong attitude. And I think anyone that is used to making discoveries in science or innovating and taking risks, you know, would admit that uh, you must allow for the evidence to guide you rather than assuming that you know the answer in advance because then it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. You will not collect the data that would allow you to learn something new. And that's a very simple idea. Nevertheless, people have a hard time accepting it, you know, starting from the philosophers during the days of Galileo that refused to look through his telescope because they knew that the sun moves around the earth. And, uh, you know, even a month ago, there was an article in uh, Nature Mag uh, Astronomy magazine uh, by a philosopher arguing that Oumuamua, this strange object that was discovered in 2017, didn't look like a comet or an asteroid. That strange object must be natural, he said, this uh, philosopher. And I thought to myself, haven't we learned something over the past four centuries? Right. Now, I'm going to have Mark ask you, like, the real nitty-gritty of the Galileo project as far as the technology. Uh, Mark has actually worked on, uh, for a number of years, on something, I don't want to say similar, but he, he knows enough to ask uh, the right questions. But before that, I just wanted to address one quick thing, and that I was kind of surprised to see that Seth Shostak from SETI was part of the team. Seth Shostak is also someone that ridicules, um, you know, the idea of UFOs, uh, the possibility that they could be extraterrestrial. Here on this show, I never say that I know they're extraterrestrial because I don't. But he just, even the thought of it, he just goes, well, you know. So apparently he changed uh, his attitude by 180 degrees because he wrote a Scientific American article where he supports the Galileo project. Now, he's not uh, a member of the research team. He's a member oh. of the Scientific Advisory Board. And, uh, you know, we uh, in the research team are following a path uh, that uh, we can talk about uh, that involves uh, selecting instruments and then testing them and eventually taking data. He is more of an advisory, uh, in an advisory capacity. And right now he's quite supportive of what we are doing. So that, that illustrates the, uh, the fact that, you know, people can change their views and you shouldn't pay too much attention to what they say. You should be guided by the desire to, to get more data, more evidence. Yeah, and I know funding's a big part of that, and that's always something he's afraid of. And we'll talk more about that in a minute. But Mark, do you have a question for for Avi? Yeah, well, actually, uh, it's great to see you again, Avi. Um, great. To when see we were, uh, you know, in the past few months, I implemented a remote observatory out in the Arizona desert, uh, and I run it from here. I'm in Connecticut, so it's 2,500 miles away. I can access it and work with it, take imagery and so forth. Um, it's a wide angle view so i get you know like a two degree field so it's kind of interesting um and that telescope behind me right there is actually for this observatory here in connecticut we're making a new building so we have two that are going to run on the east and west coast right so my question becomes um what um what types of instrumentation are you planning to use for galileo right so we plan to have it each telescope system will have a few telescopes so that we can get a parallax. In other words, see the right. object from different directions to map its uh, motion in three dimensions. Uh, so uh, those telescopes may not have high resolution. They would potentially be able to um, resolve a feature the size of a cell phone on an object at a distance of a mile. That roughly would be their resolution. And uh, that would allow us to track the motion of unusual objects. Of course, if it looks like a bird, then uh, we don't care too much about it. If it looks like a drone or an airplane, we also don't care about it. Anything that is human made would be for us as boring as a bird. Right. Uh, and we, you know, I'm sure there are residents of Washington DC that would care a lot about an object that says made in China, made in Russia. But for us, it's not really exciting. And yeah. what we would look for are other types of objects. Now, in order to be able to get a high, higher resolution image, we will need a bigger telescope within that system. 
but uh, all the data will be fed to state-of-the-art uh, cameras that uh, we are starting to test now. And then uh, the key is really the computer system that will uh, filter objects of interest out of the data stream. It will be a huge data stream that we can't store, but once we identify an object of interest, we'll track it and collect data on it both from reflected sunlight during the day or from infrared emission during the night and day uh, by the object. You know, if an object moves faster than sound in air, it should heat up. We know it from uh, supersonic uh, airplanes. We know it from the, uh, the, the space shuttle. Uh, they both got heated up by hundreds of degrees and that, that kind of temperature emits in the infrared and you can see it at night, the, this glow, this heat. Uh, and then, of course, we'll have radar systems and uh, look for radio uh, reflection or emission by, by the objects of interest. And altogether, we want to use multiple wavelengths and, uh, so that we can verify that it's a real object. And it's, it's not a, a phenomenon in the atmosphere. It's not some weather pattern. Uh, and that will take some time for us to build the software and to put together a set of instruments that we buy off, off, off the shelf uh, so that it uh, performs to our satisfaction. Once we have such a system in place, then we will produce copies of it. And the number of copies that we produce depends on the level of funding. So as of now, I received over the past month donations, commitments for donations at the level of up to uh, $2 million. And that would allow us to have perhaps 10 such systems. That's not enough. We did some calculations about the statistics of UAP reports. Yeah. And we need more like a hundred or hundreds of such systems. So it's very good that you have a one or two, but the point is it really needs to be hundreds in order to cover enough of the sky and have a high likelihood of seeing something of the type that was reported uh, to Congress. And uh, we hope to get uh, funded at a level that is 10 times bigger than we currently are. Uh, and that's the, the origin for this uh, crowdfunding that we started. We, we hope to get up to $10 million to $20 million, and then we can do a comprehensive study. And, and definitely the data will be open to the public. Everyone would be able to use it and analyze it. So there will be nothing hidden. And the, the instruments that we will use will all be under full control. There will not be like a camera in a jittery cockpit of a, jet, a fighter jet. You know. Right, there'll be control yeah. systems that can you know, target specific locations. Yeah. And, and you might ask why astronomical observatories that exist right now that are looking at the sky never report about UAP. Well, the answer is simple. If there, there is a bird flying above a telescope, uh, astronomers ignore it. But we will monitor it. We will track it. Well, the other thing is, too, that you know, usually those observatories are not wide angle observatories. They're actually just like like a pencil point in the sky. Right. So they're only looking at narrow ranges. Um, and so the likelihood of something passing through is it's very unlikely. If you put a cork in a bathtub and look through a straw and try to find the cork, you may never find it. Right. You no, know, because so that, uh, you see, that, that's exactly the reason that we decided after 70 years of people reporting about unusual objects, you know, and it may well be a mixed bag. Maybe most reports have some mundane explanations, you know, but we are sending our hooks and whatever fish we find, it's like a fishing expedition. We don't assume anything, and we will report back what, whatever we find. And maybe we will not find any interesting fish, but uh, maybe we will, and, and uh, we shouldn't assume anything. Yeah, so, yeah. I was working and still do with Douglas Trumbull, a visual effects guy. And uh, he and I were working on a project uh, called the Aerial Anomaly Detection System. And of course, it was all about funding. We could not get the funding because when people heard the word UFO, uh, they just ran the other way, you know. So basically, we had to change it to aerial anomaly detection system. We just did that. So who knows what will happen? But it, again, it's a series of platters with instrumentation because I think if you can look in the sky in a broad view of the sky, all right, you should be able to detect something. And we put them at various distances from each other laid out in threes, for instance, so they can triangulate positions overhead. It sounds a similar thing to Galileo, yes. um, but ours are ours might be movable. They might be little platters that can actually be moved to different locations. And then you just get that GPS coordinate for that exact location, and the other system will know it, and then you can triangulate to a, a pretty good degree. Yeah, so we should, we should learn from your experience. That would be interesting for us to learn. 
Uh, yeah. But I should say that um, the, re the reason we have funding is simply because uh, a number of donors uh, came to the porch of my home and uh, <laughs> or con contacted me. These are people that I've, I haven't met uh, more than a month ago. They just uh, read my book, uh, Extraterrestrial. They were intrigued by all the interviews that I gave and they had questions and then they decided that they, they are inspired by the vision. And uh, it's interesting that the funding came from the private sector, you know, from individuals that really care about this question. And uh, mm -hmm. it's not as if this research will take away money from existing programs like the search for dark matter. So I think the science community should support it because we are not taking funds away from anything that is done right now. We are actually adding funds. And moreover, we are looking for evidence. What else can be better for science than data? And it just strikes me as strange if uh, seeing some scientists um, still uh, pushing back against this project. Yeah, you're right. I mean, the reticence, the reticence to, 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 to move forward with this type of thinking you know, it goes back to when I was getting my astronomy degree. I talked to the director of my observatory and I told him that I believe it's a populated universe. That's what I, I told him. And he looked at me and he laughed at me and said, hey, come on, get back in the observatory, leave Captain Kirk to us. That's what he said to me. Exactly. Well, you know, you know, that was my experience as a kid. That was the thing that I remember the most. When I was a kid, I used to sit at dinner with adults and I would ask a, a difficult question. And the adults in the room would pretend that they know much more than they actually know. That yeah. was response number one. And the second response was when they didn't have a good answer, they would simply dismiss the question. Right. And I must say that as a senior scientist, I have a very similar feeling. And that bothers me, uh, you know, because science is supposed to be open-minded and based on evidence. And, you right. know, it's exactly the same feeling as when I was a kid. And I... I will never surrender for that kind of an approach. I mean, it makes little sense. The only way for us to learn something new is not to surrender to this uh, pretension by the adults in the room, so to speak, because they don't really know what they're talking about. I, I get accused yeah. all the time of being, sorry, Martin, I'll, I'll let you go in a second. Sorry, apologize. It's your show. Um, uh, I get accused all the time of, of, of uh, being someone who believes extraterrestrial life is out there and, and uh, okay, accuse me. I believe it is. I, I have no doubt. And and I'm actually one of the few, I think, that, that I, I really don't have any arrogance about this. Science can be arrogant, as you know. Right. And that's because they have a feeling of for, for what they feel is right. They know what they have, their 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 dogma, their 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 uh their unabashed attention to their detail and their concepts. Well, what your, your approach is the modest approach to assume that we exist, conditions on so many tens of billions of planets are similar in terms of surface temperature to that on Earth. And uh, why should we assume that we are special and unique? Why should we assume that the play is about us, that we are the central actors? I we agree. might be just like an ant among many ants on the sidewalk of the Milky Way galaxy, you know? And yep. I think that is the modest approach. So everyone else that claims otherwise is arrogant. And they're yeah, arrogant. It's just, the arrogance of science has always bothered me, and I just determined I will never be that guy. You know, stay open-minded. Yes, you might be wrong, but you know what? Be okay being wrong, right? I'm okay being disproven. That's fine. Yeah, but if we collect evidence, there is nothing bad that can come out of it. Anyone no. that says let's not collect evidence is behaving just like those philosophers that refuse to look through the telescope of Galileo. And that's, that's right. why we called it the Galileo project. That's and, a very uh, good name. I like that name too, by the way. Yeah. That's a beautiful name for it. That's my yeah. son's middle name, by the and way. And if Galileo was around, he would be a honorary member of our group. I bet he would. My, my son Gabe, his middle name, Galileo. But, but they, by the way, he would have been canceled on social media today. <laughs> uh, I'm pretty sure about <laughs> that. <me. laughs> he would. So I brought, I brought Ted in, Ted Rose in here too. Uh, Ted does uh, some great uh, research. Um, so, but, and you're welcome to chime in, but I, I, I just have a couple of questions and one of them, do those guys that show up on your door, were they wearing black suits by chance? <laughs> no. <laughs> just a joke. Yeah. No, anyway, they were uh, just humans yeah. that had questions about my book and um, very nice yeah. people, very nice people. Yeah. And uh, actually with one of them, we went for a walk for three hours and, 
so altogether, you know, these are people that are really curious about the question of are we the smartest kid on the block? And my point is <clears throat> now we have a channel for crowdfunding that uh, people with um, you know, with contributions that are quite you know minimal, uh, the cost of a dinner are you know are are really welcome to contribute to the project. And if we have enough of of such contributions, we will be able to buy more more telescopes. And it will be all about creating more copies of the same system so that we can distribute them around the globe and get more data on UAP. Is this going to be like the WASP system at all? No, it's different. Uh, I mean, we are building our own systems that have a different, uh, different hardware, different software. So that's why, you know, it, it was never done before what we are doing. So we, we, are, we have a lot of discussions about that. And of course, there are some members of the research team that are that worked on 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 searching for exoplanets, and um, but the, the 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 search that we have is quite different than astronomy in general because the objects we are tracing are moving on the sky quite fast. Now, mm -hmm. the second component of the project I should have mentioned is also searching for objects like Oumuamua that are weird that came into the solar system from outside and. Uh, do not look like a comet or an asteroid. You know, there was an interstellar object that looked just like a comet, Borisov. Mm -hmm. And uh, Oumuamua was nothing like Borisov. So, uh, and, and, and the, you know, people that are claimed to be mainstream in astronomy, they tried to explain the properties of Oumuamua and only came up with uh, types of objects that we've never seen before, like a nitrogen iceberg, a hydrogen iceberg. And to me, it always reminds me of, uh, you know, a caveman that is presented with a cell phone and is used to playing with rocks. The caveman would say it's just a shiny rock. But of course, it's the beginning of a learning experience because the caveman can press a button and then record his or her voice and uh, press another button and record an image. And and uh, if we happen to get more data on an unusual rock, quote unquote, we might be able to press some buttons there. I have a, a couple of questions for you, Avi. And the first one is, um, so this is being funded through Harvard. You're using... Um, no, it's private donations that were given to my research account through Harvard. But you're, because I but, cannot, okay. I cannot uh, accept funds directly to me. Uh, only through Harvard, because that's my employer, and it goes straight to the project. Okay, and did is, they have no problem in doing this part of it? Oh, so that was interesting. I was asked uh, before we announced the project whether it uh, relates to my research as an astronomer, because if not, it would have been regarded as activity outside of the scope of my research at Harvard. And I explained that my duty as an astronomer, and I, I've been practicing that for decades now, is to interpret data that comes from telescopes. That's what I do as an astronomer. They agreed with that. And then I said, the only difference here is we use telescope but collect data on nearby objects. Now, there is no restriction in astronomy to look at objects that are very far away. There is no minimum distance. You know, we look at comets, we look at meteors. These are objects that come relatively nearby. And Oumuamua, for example, came from very far away, just approached us. So it's still part of astronomy. And they agreed with this reasoning. They said, yes, it is astronomy, even though you're looking at nearby objects. So it, there was no issue. After I explained that, it's regarded as part of my research. And it's astronomy, as far as I'm concerned. And we will try and figure out the nature of these objects that are currently unidentified. And you could so all... I know find these yeah, new objects too yeah. that might be uh, eventually classified as a, a potential danger to the planet too. So you've got that going for you as well. Right, right. But uh, as I said before, if it happens to be human-made, it would be very boring, as boring as seeing a bird as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, me too. So, <laughs> so um, you know, I'm happy to put into the software a, a, an automatic uh, transfer of data to uh, residents of Washington, D.C., if it happens to show letters of the alphabet, our alphabet. Mm. Yeah. Oh, yeah. They, they would like to have that information. Okay. Um, just just a couple of, of uh, questions. I, I, first of all, before you go tonight, I want you to elaborate how someone can get to that funding. I do have the I do have the link below and the either the show notes are down in the text uh, on the video. But um, my what my last question, I guess, is 
how do you figure out where you're going to put these objects and uh, these uh, the the equipment? And is this protected equipment that it's got to be away from people so no one's going to buy? It sounds expensive. So, I mean, how are you going to protect it as well? Right. So that's the same issue that the astronomers face. And often there is a guard or some fence around. Some of our telescopes will be on the sites of observatories because mountaintops are you know, the best locations in the sense that the atmosphere is more rarefied up there and uh, therefore blaring of the images uh, is uh, weaker than, than at sea level, so to speak. But uh, as to where to put them, you know, that there, there is a claim that uh, there is a clustering of UAP reports about, around the sensitive facilities like military facilities or nuclear facilities. Um, it may well be a result of having more patrols around those areas because they're sensitive. And uh, one thing we mm. want to find out is whether this clustering is real or just a reflection of having more pilots monitor these areas. And um, so we plan to distribute our observatories in, in many different locations. Oh, again, it's limited by the funding we get. And we haven't yet decided specifically about the locations. Uh, and with respect to the, your, your other uh, comment or question, um, the crowdfunding is possible through a link on our website. So if you just Google the Galileo Project, Harvard University, Avi Loeb, you will get to that website. And there is a, a, a tab, uh, Support Us. And if you click on that, you will see the, uh, the guidelines for how to contribute, irrespective of the amount. Yes. Uh, so, Mark or Ted, do you, either one of you have a another one more question? Um, I, I do. Um, this is Ted. Ryan. I've been working on this for twenty years, collecting data, aviation cases, um, understanding the general trends in that data, and trying to get a uh, an overall vision of, of what we might be looking at. You know, throw it all against the wall, then you have a scope, right? And then you can from there you can start rationally engaging various aspects of, of the phenomenon. And um, in the process, I learned that there were places where there are clusters. Um, and um, I've been exposed to a couple of them through um, Mr. Erling Strand and Dr. Massimo Teodorani. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I, I want to know if, if there's any real attention for looking at a couple of these spots. Um, I think there's some real merit listening to those two men. Um, yes. I, I've been I've been on searches with them, and we've collected data. They're they're um, very rigorous in their methodology and and uh, 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 ethical, uh, yeah. which is a. Uh, so, have you thought at all about talking to these fellows and looking into their work? Oh yeah, we we already had a conversation with uh, Massimo, uh, mm -hmm. and he provided the useful information, and we will definitely take. Uh, this into consideration when we decide about the locations. But just to explain, at first, in the coming weeks and maybe uh, months, uh, we will uh, have to purchase uh, the relevant equipment and then test it to make sure that we, when we put it together, it operates uh, to our satisfaction, including developing the software that we need. And then once we have it working, then we'll have to decide uh, which locations to put it at. And of course, as I said, again, that depends on the level of funding. The more funding we have, the more locations we can sample and, and examine exactly the point you made, whether there is clustering. And definitely we will pay attention to the reports that some areas are uh, have a higher chance or, or uh, report rate of, of uh, UAP. Yes. I, I strongly recommend that you do. I've been in a couple of those places and they should be very interesting to, to you. Um, and I want to say it's very refreshing to, to hear proper attitudes about inquiry and objectivity. I've spent 20 years underground, basically, in the wild. Yeah. Well, I should <laughs> and, say it's not, uh, it's not original to me because when the report was delivered to Congress, Bill Nelson, the NASA administrator, said that scientists should look into that. So, you know, I'm just trying to make him happy. <laughs> well, <laughs> you're making more than him happy. And uh, 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 I don't know if you saw any of our presentations to the AIAA two weeks ago, uh, Dr. Koparapu yeah. and Dr. Knuth and myself and um, Peter Real and all those guys. So um, 
I, I presented our preliminary findings with NARCAP, that, that, and I hope that everybody takes a look at that. And any help I can be to share anything or offer insights, you know, just just from long experience, I'm I'm happy to contribute however I can. Thank you very much. We definitely appreciate experience, uh, but uh, we would like to collect new data to substantiate it with... Uh, Very the important. Instruments. The instruments nowadays are far better than they used to be two decades ago, and uh, if we have full control over them, then we can deliver the uh, evidence to the mainstream of the science community, because I do think that it should be there. Well, yeah, some new data, that, that's fine with me. I, uh, we don't have... We shouldn't have sacred cows in this field of, you know, cases that we consider inviable and that, that you know, or um, yeah. and, and people and researchers that, that stand in front of the data. I think that's I, I have a one one caveat to what you said. There should be one sacred principle, and that is paying attention to evidence and not prejudice. That should that's be right. Principle. Yeah, exactly. I right. Agree. I agree. Exactly Mark, right. you have a last question. You have a last question, Mark. I was going to suggest, uh, Avi, did you uh, consider uh, uh, a portability option for these? So that oh, yeah, can, that's an excellent uh, point, uh, Mark. Yeah, definitely. That's an excellent point. Yeah, yeah. Too. I mean, I've got a portable observatory we're building to, to do outreach because I think it's important to show people what's happening to get more involved, right? So right. one-on-one -on -one what can be done. Yeah, it's it's uh, not just for that reason. It, it you know we if we can put it on a truck and move it to uh, we can sample many locations with the same uh, yeah that's the primary that's the primary uh, obviously motivation of course but sure yeah yeah I yeah. think uh, you know once we get evidence that would be exciting you know the public will go crazy about it irrespective of whether we go around with a truck or not yeah. mm -hmm. well you you lend it credibility also. I mean, if it was just one of, I hate to say it this way, but if it was myself out there, you know, with equipment and I got this image or whatever, I wouldn't have what you have, the level of credibility you have, uh, you know, to bring this to the table. So we, uh, I can say for myself and probably many others that we really do appreciate that you're, you're investing yourself in this and, uh, and I really like your attitude. And I really Thank you. Uh, I should say that we have a team of 20 exceptional scientists. It's not just me. And uh, mm -hmm. there, are there are some exceptional uh, instrumentalists in the team that are that will be putting things together. So everyone deserves the credit. Mm -hmm. Yes. Very good. good. All right. Well, thank you very much, Avi. And uh, we will look to see what happens with what you're doing in the future. I will be delighted to join you again. Thank Great you. to see you, right. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. All right. Well, that was great. And so, it Ted, um, yeah, uh, welcome to the show. We have Ted and Mark. And you guys have never really talked to each other. I just found that out. And no, I thought no. I just had this I had this uh, wild idea. Ted, you and I were you and I were in touch when this uh, this talk that you did, you're going to talk about. Um, you text me and um, and then I was uh, it was last week and I, I almost pulled you into last week's show. And then, so I said, hey, Mark, do you mind being on, you know, sharing a show with someone you never talked to before? He said, yeah, why not? So why not? here we are together. I hope we get along okay. Oh, it'll be oh, fine. Really. There won't yeah. be any problem. Ah. Yeah. So um, I want to hear from both of you. You both have things going on. And I don't know who wants to start first. Mark, you have this observatory. You and I have talked about it many times out in Arizona. Yeah. Um, but, you know, just real quickly, I think – because I have so many new listeners all the time, it wouldn't hurt too bad. I know some people are going to be rolling their eyes. I can almost see them now. But a little recap on who you are and what you do. Let's start with you, Mark. Oh, I'm MUFON's chief photo and video analyst um, and uh, an astronomer, of course. And um, uh, so I spent many years. I knew I was going to be an astronomer since age nine. Uh, and I stuck with it, you know, and that's what I went to school for. And I worked in big observatories and small, and I decided that I wanted to do some observatory building of my own. So I built two, one's in the Arizona desert, one's here in Connecticut. That telescope behind me right there is actually the East Coast uh, Observatory uh, Telescope Unit. We're actually building a new building here, and that's we outgrew the other one. And so that one's in here for oh. maintenance and rehab. Um, and yeah. uh, so that, that's you, what I did. It's called and, Sky Tour, right? The the thing you yes. do live is the Sky, sky tour. tour. 
Sky Tour live stream is the live observatory, and we just had gangbuster nights out in Arizona. You have 300 clear nights a year. You, you, right. know, you don't get lost. Look at the bags. Okay. Um, <laughs> but the bottom line, the bottom line is that you know I believe science is for everybody. Okay. So does Avi, and that was what was kind of cool listening to him. Science is for everybody, uh, and it just it just means that they have to have it explained in a way they can understand and digest. That's the problem. As I said, it's not taught in our schools as much as it should be. And uh, it's been Absolutely. dropped. Through, right? You know, Ted, you understand that. Absolutely. You know, and so I think that, I think that when we talk about yes. science, we should actually, you know, start at an early age. I had benefit of having science taught to me at an early age. I had benefit of 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 doing unbelievable stuff in my, my science class. Okay, my high school chemistry. Okay, when I was doing organic chemistry in, in high school at that time. We had the benefit of actually getting a rock, and because we had been taught so well, okay, inorganic chemistry actually, and they we were taught so well that the teacher said, "Okay, this is a rock. Identify it and extract it, the ore from it if there's ore in it." And that was the final exam. And for three days, we worked in the school lab extracting ore from our samples. And I'm telling you, I still have the copper from the copper ore that I extracted in a little glass jar. Okay, yeah. they shake. I did that years and years ago. See, so that's the benefit of science. You never forget good science, you know. So that's what I'm all about. And, and the public outreach thing is great, you know. Um, I, in fact, and I was on. Uh, I, I was actually doing interviews. I did an interview in Anchorage today. Do you uh, are you familiar with uh, uh, KWHL Radio? That's Ted? where Ted is right now. Yes. Yeah. yeah. yeah KWHL Radio. Uh, it was Bob Lester and, and Brock Lindo. That was their show. Um, mm -hmm. I didn't hear about it before, but I got on their show and they want me on as a regular now as a regular oh. contributor because they like to nice. talk about UFOs. It's one of their favorite topics. So you should call them at, at <laughs> KWHL and I'll bet you you're going to have a way in there. All you know, right. Talk, yeah. You get to yeah, work thank out. Thank you very much. Sure. Sure. I'll do that. Um, so uh, before you before you jump in, Ted, just real quickly, Mark, one of the things I liked from your the very from the very first time I met you was that you have a way of explaining things that are difficult, but down to the level where anyone can digest it. And I do. I've always appreciated that about you. Oh, you don't well, get all sciencey and technical where it, people start eyes. I start glazing over and any it's of that so stuff. Easy so. To go over someone's head if they don't know the science. So what I do is. I assess their capability, right, in, in science. And, and again, it comes from the schooling. It's not their fault, <laughs> okay? It's not their fault that they don't know it. So it's the, I assume the responsibility to enlighten the parts they don't know if I know the answers. I don't know everything, obviously. But I do know certain things, you know? And I think that um, it makes sense to be able to talk to people at their level and engage with them. And then they... They open up, they ask questions, and there is, and I've said this a thousand times, there is no dumb question. You know, no dumb questions, just yeah, stupid sure. answers. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Ted, how about well, you, sir. Ted? Well, um, I'm Ted Rowe. I ran NARCAP from the time Dr. Haynes and I founded it. I was executive director, and then when Dr. Haynes retired in 2015, I took over the organization as a director of research. Um, our entire goal in all of this has been to influence the aviation community because we felt that by if we could change the aviation community, we'd change the world. Um, and, and so we worked very hard. Uh, Dr. Haynes had accumulated uh, several thousand aviation cases, and many of them reflected aviation safety factors. So we, we, we set our focus on that. The, the most data are in those cases where safety factors are involved. Things like, oh, close pacing, mid -air collision, near mid-air collisions, um, collision headings, uh, all of these things, uh, re, uh, concurrent failures of electrical systems during an encounter, all of these things kind of tell us a little bit about what's going on with these things in the physics of it all. Then we can understand the flight dynamics when they are behaving dynamically. So we look at those cases and we, the first paper we wrote was aviation safety in America, a previously neglected factor. And that was in, in 1999. 
So we, we started the conversation on aviation safety in this subject, and we also established the UAP term and, and our definition of it in 1999. And obviously it's gone viral. Everybody's using it now, but, but it has a definition and that's on the website. Um, it's, it's actually a, 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 a term that you arrive at after you've done the work. It's not a UAP until you've resolved that it's not anything else. Um, and uh, and our, like I said, our focus has been trying to get towards the aviation community. We've been very conservative. You won't find little aliens dancing on our website. Um, we've been very focused on, on serving our demographic, which are pilots and air controllers, because they face a stigma. The FAA absolutely rejects their reports, you know, uh, uh, pilot, pilots and air controllers. And that's been going on right up till right now when they're seriously trying to remedy their image in this this particular change, sea change we're dealing with, with the DNI report. Um, yeah. Well, very good. I, I have a, a quick question for you. Um, when it comes to aviation and all that, I always think of um, 2007 and gate, C-17 Chicago Air Airport um, for the for United Airlines and all that. Um, and the question is, uh, it seems to me that eventually some of those people that were there that day are have retired by now and could talk freely freely about what they saw. As, does anyone else hear that? I don't know where that came from. That. Yeah. Interesting. So uh, anyway, has has anyone ever that, uh, that you're aware of, has anyone ever come forward? Um, no, we've we've the case kind of comes to life every now and then. But uh, um, the the whole thing, um, I, I, I don't think so. We only had one possible photograph of the case, for example, of the object itself by one of the people, one of the ground crew. Uh, and that was referenced by the ramp controller uh, for United that reported it to co the control tower. And that photograph never turned up. I did the photo analysis for that that case. And all we got were hoaxes, um, lots of them. It was kind of disheartening. So you never got it? You never got that particular photo? No, no. I, I never saw the photo that was alleged to be that. And, and it's... Um, um, and since then, you know, it, it, like I said, it, it's like it's one of these zombie cases. It comes back to life every now and then. And people find themselves with a uh, they claim to have new data and so on and new witnesses and all that. But I I, I just ignore it. I, I haven't had anything come to me. So, yeah, you know, that like Roswell thing, Ted, you know, I mean, you know what? We're not going to see any new information about Roswell. There's nothing new that can come out now that we can actually trust. Number one. And number two, that's actually in existence for real, in my view. I think that that's, that's so far in the past, we need to leave it in the past and just focus on the here and now moving forward. Well, um, this is the thing that I, I agreed with Avi on his point there of, you know, new data. Uh, the phenomenon is real. Yes, we've got, we've got cases, we've got data, we've got stories, we've got anecdotes, we've got all this stuff. But new data is coming because it's a real phenomenon. And let let them get it, and let's work it. Um, frankly, a lot of us are going to get phased out of this over time. I um, I did this work for twenty years underground, uh, in the wild, basically collecting cases and uh, working data and trying to influence the aviation system, uh, keeping my own experiences to myself, more or less. And uh, um, uh, and at some point, these guys or or people like them are going to pick up the ball and move on. Uh, and that's what was so important about the AIAA conference, the American Institute for Aeronautics and Astronautics conference. It's it's the largest aviation engineering society in the world. And and it's an American society that, that is a major driver in research and development in the aviation system. Uh, and they invited us, myself and five others, to present to them uh, to their conference on August 6th, I believe it was. Um, and that was a very important moment. It was probably one of the most important moments in ufology. Uh, we've had a couple of them over the last few years, but, but certainly this one, this was, we were, the purpose was to advocate for scientific inquiry. And, uh, uh, and so we were presenting rationale for aviation science to look more closely at these cases as a group, to follow the DNI rep recommendation that the stigma be lifted and that people start talking about this stuff. 
So yeah, that, that was a real watershed moment. I posted the presentations on our website at NARCAP, uh, but there were presentations by Dr. Ravi Kaparapu, who was a planetary scientist at Goddard uh, NASA Space Flight Center. Um, there was uh, um, Dr. Kevin Knuth made a presentation there, uh, a very interesting one, I might add. Uh, uh, Peter Rialli from SCU was there and did a talk on, on uh, flight dynamics and kinematics. Um, and then Ryan Graves was there with personal experience from being an F-18 pilot confronting UAP in the course of his duty. Um, and then myself, I presented over the last our 20 years of uh, preliminary findings of 20 years of research. And then uh, uh, and then the final one was Philippe Alaris, who presented on aviation safety factors and data collection uh, schemas for uh, uh, UAP research. So uh, it was a very it was very level. And I think it was really kind of telling who they picked to make these talks versus who the, the faces are in this field. Um, I thought that was terribly interesting myself. But. Yeah. yeah. So you have the presentations on the site, right? Yes, yes, I do. There are playlists on the NARCAP website, uh, YouTube channel. Excuse, excuse me, the NARCAP YouTube channel is gotcha. where you go for that. Hmm. Yeah. Um, and I offered uh, findings from 100 years of pilot data. Huh. I've got UAP cases all the way back to 1916. Wow. Yeah. And in, in they, what they, form? In, in what form were they back then? Okay, the first UAP report that I have from 1916, the pilot complained of being accosted by six flying manhole covers. He called them disc forms. <laughs> About that, yeah. Yeah. 1924, I had a DH-4 pilot flying a mail route over Nevada, and uh, he said he was forced to land after an encounter with a huge wingless cylinder which is, looks a lot like the one that David Hastings photographed over Nevada in 1985, which is a very sobering photograph as well. He almost hit it with his airplane. Um, what I found anyway in analyzing all this data, first off, it didn't start in the 40s. Uh, whenever UAP started, it started much earlier for pilots. Um, there's a general set of profiles that pilots encounter primarily, which are balls of light, disks, spheres, and cylinders. You know, there are other things out there, but they're outlier data. The general data carries those four profiles. I've done a, uh, an analysis of their flight dynamics, um, uh, which is put, puts us on in, in some really interesting territory, I think. Um, they, they don't experience resistance to changes in velocity or direction. And that that's very important, given that they don't use uh, propulsive thrust or aerodynamic lift to fly. So there's no, um, they, when they want to stop, they just stop. They don't have any respect for the, the four forces that make an aircraft able to fly, which are drag, lift, thrust, and gravity, right? Uh, an airplane flies as a concert of those things, and these don't do any of that. I think that's a, so. direct, that's a direct result of the propulsion methodology uh, that oh, yeah. they carry out because uh, it's more like shifting, I think, rather than actually moving forward through space, like a space, you know, they're shifting from one place to another. I think and they're, get, yeah. you might say decoupled from the local space time. They're, they're not, that, yeah, you're right. that's the same they're, I don't know how to explain that, but that that's kind of the, the gist of it. They, there are temporal effects associated with getting close to them, which is another clue about, about what these things might be like. Um, you know, the technology involved, if, if we experience temporal effects, if we get close to them and we experience an acceleration in time, for example, um, we're probably looking, I would guess, in general relativistic corners for information on how that's possible. Um, we should also explain decoupling. I don't know. It could. Yeah, it could. I mean, there's a there's a way in which that could all apply in, in, in some form or another. I, I just haven't mm -hmm. ever experienced any time dilation effects, as you're referring to. Yeah, it's, it's, it's part of what got me in here. There's the personal experience that brought me into this field. And um, um, and I did have a, a pretty blatant one. And, um, and I got very close to it at less than 15 feet. Um, and I, I saw the crew and all the other stuff. But the whole point is the, the, the physics of this thing and the way it moved. Uh, at one point, it moved very quickly and it should have killed the crew. And they didn't even rock on their heels. So they weren't experiencing inertia. 
either, you know? Um, yeah. So, so you're talking about Ted, Ted, are you talking about you saw a crew that was on a craft? Is that yes. what you're saying? That's how I got involved in all of this. So I, I think you and I talked about that um, years ago a little bit. And you also mentioned that you had a sighting in Oakland on the, um, and you saw this thing up above, you were in a car and you were driving along, you were riding as a passenger and you saw this thing. And I think you said Oakland along that way or East Bay somewhere. And yeah, it was you knew East that Bay. craft, that craft, uh, whatever it was, you knew that it knew that you were in the car or something along those lines, right? Well, we saw it from miles away and it intercepted us and stopped less than 15 feet from the vehicle. And then it, it made a maneuver around us. I mean, it, it was pretty obviously focused on us, and I don't know why, but it's what got me involved in all of this. I, I made a report to the uh, PR office at Ames Research Center and um, uh, got a call back from Dr. Haynes. Um, and one thing led to another and um, ended up running NARCAP and then having to basically sideline that experience and bury it. Um, but it, it, it helps inform my understanding of how they move. And the kinds of but the, the kinds of effects that, and situations that the researchers like Abby are going to end up encountering, it, it, you know, if their work is sincere in all of this, uh, I, my experiences are certainly what I know they are, and they're going to run into this eventually. And it goes down a rabbit hole. Uh, some of us are a little ways down there. You know, we we don't have a um, I don't have a reputation to protect. You know, I can talk about this, and now they've given us a license to speak of to where I can at least say that I've seen it, you know, and, and that's been the hardest thing is, is having credibility. It's one of the only fields I know where you can have, uh, where you lose credibility by having experience with what you're studying. <laughs> wow. That, that, that's, I never thought of that, but you're right. Um, there's a question in Facebook and we're going to be going into break here in like three minutes. And, uh, I'm hoping you guys can hang out. I don't really, um, Actually, could play a video from last week. It would just be a repeat. I might just do that. But here's a question uh, from Stella Bell and Facebook. Have you guys looked into anti-mass field theory? It cancels the mass. It can go to uh, FTL travel. Uh, anyway, like, um, that's what she's... has anyone looked into this, either one of you? I, I personally have not because um, it requires such a different view of what we call mass that we don't have enough science to even surround that with anything meaningful at the moment. I, uh, I tend to avoid that stuff. Let the data speak for itself. We'll come to a consensus as we all look at it. And that was what was terribly interesting about the AIAA presentations is that we were all speaking about different situations. Most of the presenters were speaking about specific cases. I was speaking in generalities and yet we were all saying the same thing that these UAP, they demonstrate very specific uh, flight characteristics that are uh, that we all agree that are there and they're very curious. Uh, and then I added a bit to the conversation on ball of light phenomena based on observations I've had in Arizona um, and uh, um, other places and that and and on what our pilots are reporting in terms of, for example, colors, uh, they look a lot like the emission spectra of specific atmospheric atoms. Um, the orange helium, right? Um, blues or nitrogen, reds, neon, um, yellow, yellow or white, yellow or white, whitish green could be oxygen. You know, there's, um, oh, yeah. yeah, exactly. So, so there's a whole, um, uh, uh, possibility of, of, of a direction to look in terms of understanding these ball of light phenomena as plasma generators. Um, okay. Sorry, my camera will be back. Okay. <laughs> That's all right. Um, so we are just about ready to go into into uh, break, but I wanted to. Uh, yeah, I guess I guess it would be time to go in. So I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to play the video for those people um, that I played last week. I just didn't get a chance today to to bring anything on. So hang in there over at KGR A Radio. We'll be right back right after these messages in right about three minutes.
and but uh, Kevin, there was how many would you say that you saw in one any given situation at at one time? Um, they appeared on the radar in groups of five to ten at a time. And if I was to add up all the groups over the um, entire period of time we were tracking these things, there was probably about a hundred total objects. Now I don't have any idea if um, they were a hundred separate objects or they were the same five you know groups the same groups um, basically repeating somehow. I don't even know if they're all the same shape and size because all I'm looking at on my on my console is a symbol. Symbology represents everything. Uh -huh. So it's um, based on my loose my loose math of about a hundred altogether. So you know the going back to you know Gary's thoughts or whatever have it just seems like if there was this tic tac shaped. Uh, obj object objects that was developed by the military and they were testing them you just seem it, you would seem to kind of get the idea that a lot of people would be seeing them it wouldn't just be your situation you know they'd be seeing them over and over and over and and uh, uh are there any other um you know people that have come forward saying they're seeing the same objects that you're aware of I know Ke Kevin has done some research in this, with, especially with the sightings around the same area that we were at. And apparently, there's been hundreds of people that have seen it. So yeah, and then and then the recent, the more recent uh, events on the East Coast with the Roosevelt Battle Group. Um, according to some of the reports I've heard from those guys, is they were seeing them some sort of objects out there on, almost on a daily basis for for a period of time. But that's more and like that, that's where the. Go ahead. That's where the gimbal and the go fast videos came yeah, from. Yeah, I was going to say, but that's the gimbal is not, you know, you're not your tic tac shape. And then you're getting, a, you're going to be getting into some other type of technology that that is, if it's our own, um, you know. It, but that is, I mean, they could have different models using the same thing. I mean, they could be for different things because, I mean, RF 18s don't look like jumbo jets. You know, I mean, it's, it's just a matter of, or they could have different purposes one could be reconnaissance one could be uh you know for use for actual combat stand by in three, two, one, go. All right. Welcome back, everyone. So my guests are Ted Rowe. Whoa, I'm blurry. Wow. I don't know what happened. This is a self-focusing. Okay. Well, maybe, it, maybe it's to my advantage. Looking blurry could be to my advantage tonight. So it's okay. Voice for radio only. So uh, bringing back, we got uh, Ted and Mark. Welcome back. Yeah. Where where are you? Yeah, there you are over there. Look, yeah, you're, over there. you're the one without the your camera went out, Mark. So yeah. I didn't realize, Mark, you're actually in your observatory. That's I was no. in there. No, right? I'm actually in my, my office. Uh actually I'm in the office where you oh. did the live show that time. Oh, okay. You, live right. broadcast. you just happen to have your, your your telescope behind you. No, that's the one that's uh, it's here because it's on a work table and I'm rehabbing it right now. Um, oh, it goes in this observatory out here, which is the buildings being built because we outgrew this the dome that we had in, on the <clears throat> front lawn of my house. Is the dome was that shipped out west? And, uh, yeah. no, all my sold, uh, and I'm building a whole new building that uses the same type of profile as the Arizona system because I need full automation here. I got to be able to do this, you know, well, automation plus remote activity, and so I need to have access in the same way. And I wrote a program to control the observatory out there in Arizona, and I'm writing the same program to run the observatory here in Connecticut, and they need to talk to each other. Because I'm gonna take pictures with one telescope at the same time as I'm taking the same pictures of the same object with this telescope. Interesting, so wow, that's really cool. First time of like the moon and things like that. No one's ever seen a true 3D image of the moon, but you will yeah. not. Hey, you must get along really well with your town office. Doing these uh, well, things on your lawn and stuff. Yeah, uh, they said to me one time, "What's that big white minion-looking thing on your front lawn?" <laughs> minion, you know, it looked like Stuart the Minion. So for Halloween one year, I dressed it up as Stuart the Minion. 
Oh, Big giant bunny. bow. Well, I could see it look like a ghost. It could also look like Casper the ghost, too. If you... you know how many cars stopped and took pictures? All of them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know. Yeah. Yeah, but but see, that's the thing. You know, Ted's talking about the the, you know, the NARCAP type things. And he's talking about all the cases with aircraft and stuff. Uh, on the observatories, I have a all sky camera because the all sky camera is a very vital piece of low light technology to be able to look at the whole sky as a whole. I have a 180 degree camera that views the whole sky all nice. at once. It's not it's not practical for doing measured things. It's great for looking at, at uh, visual things. And so I would take uh, 30 second exposures with this camera, this low light camera, and then right away take a new exposure, okay? Like of your keyboard. Uh, and <laughs> so I know, right? This is, this is live radio. So, <laughs> <laughs> no, you get it right. It, 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 you're up there. You have to do everything backwards. Yeah, I know it's backwards. So, uh, but but what's what's interesting, Ted, is about the, Ted. He's right. He's over there. No, that's you. <laughs> you have to do everything backwards here. It's really. I know. You know. Yeah. I had a question for you, Ted, too, because uh, one of the things I discovered was on this all sky camera. Okay, yes, Ted's over there. Okay, we know that. Uh, <laughs> I, I actually found something really interesting. I actually saw a uh, aerial refueler flyover. I recognize that by the the lights on the bottom, okay, mm -hmm. right? Because they're very different, obviously, from other aircraft. Naturally, well, <clears throat> it flew over, and then right uh, on its heels, okay, the the tanker flew over, and it was a like a thirty five second exposure, so it was a long trail with the punctuated lights, okay, and and the trail yeah. of the many lights on the bottom that were on. And then uh, way up in the sky, okay, above you actually, way up in the sky, mm. was in one frame there was there was a semicircular pattern. It was like there's a semicircular light pattern. And then the next frame, it completed that light pattern. Uh -huh. Same brightness. Now, you know what that says to me? I first thought, oh, well, that might be like a jet circling to do a practice tanker uh, approach. I thought that makes sense. I've seen area refueling in action. I know what it looks like mm -hmm. at night daytime uh not from the air yet but i will get there uh, but the thing is um that didn't work when you do the analysis because the brightness of the of the jet should only have been bright when its exhaust was facing me and as it went around in a circle now its exhaust isn't facing me and that semicircular sort of dimmed out and stayed dim and gone but it wasn't the whole thing was there there was no uh -huh. moon I have no idea what it was. So I caught what I think is an actual unidentified craft of some kind. I'm not saying it's a, a alien extraterrestrial craft uh, mm -hmm. at all. I mean, it was definitely, you know, appearing higher in the sky according to the photograph, but without a second position to measure it, I don't know how right. high it was, of course. And of course, right. that's one thing people say it was 5,000 feet in the air and 300 feet across. Yeah, well, the Stanford, the Stanford University and the I Institute both have done studies that show that humans cannot estimate distance in the dark when you've got one single object. They just right. can't. Right. It's a big yeah. thing far away or a small thing up close. You know, it's one of the two or something in between. So we don't know. But this object, because of the faintness of the trail and me thinking, well, if that's a jet, that's probably at a fairly high altitude. And it was a very tight circle, by the way. And if you know, if you look at a jet making a circle, a lazy circle, a fighter jet right. would make a, especially at speed, let's say 200 knots, going slow. Okay, right. it would make a fairly large circle. This was a tiny circle. This was a very small circle, but it was definitely a circle visible on two frames. It completed after two frames. So uh, I don't know what that's it was. It, yeah, you know, and that's right. That's right. That's right. Two so frames. Now you're talking about G forces. And you're talking about right going down the same path, that's right? And we had a this object seemed to make a semicircle. The first thirty seconds, it made half the circle, and the second mm -hmm. thirty seconds it completed the circle. So it basically, was like a minute for it to do mm -hmm. this. But at the at the size of the circle I was looking at, I was thinking if that's a fighter, I could calculate the rough uh, radius that a fighter at a slow approach speed might have to go. Uh, and then what the radius might appear to be. And then I can actually calculate an altitude for it based on just some trigonometric stuff. Sure. But if I don't 
know that it's a jet on the other hand, um, then I don't have any clues. I just said, well, operating from the assumption that it might be this jet aircraft, then this thing has to be in excess of, of 25,000 feet if it's a jet aircraft. But the tanker went over and its lights were very bright. And in the time, it, in the 30 second period that the tanker went over, the entire sky was full of the tanker. So that means that streak means it was a lot lower or moving at right. some high rate of speed, you know, but obviously it was probably a lot lower. Uh, right. It was probably Luke Air Force Base, actually, which is just south of me. Sure. It was heading to the south. So I don't know what it was. A really well, cool. I'll tell you that stretch out there between Phoenix and Yuma is a bit curious. Um, the observatory you know, is in that stretch. I've been in there, and uh, there's a spot in particular that uh, they took it off the the USGS maps about yeah. 1939, and uh, I've, I've sat out there, and um, I'm still processing the, the things we saw out there at ground level. Yeah. Um, and I, I, I was there once with Erling Strand. Uh, Dr. T. odorani has been there. Uh, we all have opinions about that place. Uh, Erling told me it was like Hestelin on steroids. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it, it's a terribly active spot. And it's not the only one, that whole strip along there. There's a couple of spots where, it all, where it's all kind of going down. And um, my suggestion is get a little infrared and look at the ground around those places. Well, I actually... Uh, did uh, I did kind of one better? I actually not one better, but I actually in the same vein of thinking, mm -hmm. I shot my infrared drone out there. Yeah, and I flew the infrared ground drone. Level flashers, huh? Ground level white flashing. Uh, no, I actually, there's a thing where I was flying the drone. Um, right. I flew the drone, and of course I saw coyotes and I saw other life mm -hmm. forms. Right, and I went up. <clears throat> higher than I should have. Let's just be clear, okay? But out there, yeah, no, no one's listening. <laughs> uh, and I actually had a purview of probably, uh, I'd say, 35, maybe 40 miles uh, that I could see. And I just kept circulating, going around and looking for what I could see. Uh, and with the FLIR system on this drone that I... I flew up there i had 14 minutes of time at that point mm -hmm. because of the bat and so actually about 10 because i didn't have to bring it down as well and go up at the time so uh i didn't see anything odd on the video and you know i thought hmm that's really interesting but then again uh they, they this stuff has its own schedule and just because you don't see anything doesn't mean it's not happening you know <laughs> so i've yeah. been told about the, this one particular location that there was a particular type of phenomenon to look for it had a it has a pattern to light light phenomenon and um um but nobody knows what the frequency is on the thing but i've heard locals talk about it i've heard researchers talk about it um and one night i was out there with a the crew and we, we we saw it um very close, you know, 50, 75 yards, not, not far away. Uh, and then it was accompanied eventually by a number of other light phenomena that kind of filled the area. Uh, and that's where it all just really kind of, you know, when you get exposed to enough weird, your brain will stop working. It, it, it's, I, I don't, it, it's, it, I don't know. It's kind of like tonic immobility, you know, in animals, when they get to a point where they can't run and they can't fight, they freeze. And and it's like they just wait until they're eaten. You know what I mean? They don't. Um, yeah, we do like those goats, you know, you scare them and they go, uh, boom, they just fall over. Yeah, exactly. Like, yeah. yeah. And and, when, and I've been this way in a number of situations where, where UAP, have, I've been close to them. And um, I've talked to Dr. Teodorani about it. I was trying to get some advice from him about how to how to stay functional when all this goes on. And his word was get cold, just get really cold, just and start walking towards it. He said, that's the only way that you can really face these things when they're, I'll tell you, I, I'm a free diver, right? I teach free diving uh, in Hawaii. I live in Hawaii and Alaska, but I'm, I'm in Alaska right now. Um, and I've been in the water with big sharks, you know, and I used to say, well, before that had ever happened to me, I, I used to say, well, you know, being around these things, like having a big shark come up on you, there's nowhere you can go. It, you have its attention and, and, and there, it, it's not negotiable, you know, uh, you, you, you can project anything you want on the experience itself, but the one thing you can't do is stop it. And, um, 
Uh, so I compared it to, to like the, the the inherent terror we might have being confronted by a shark. Well, I was out in the ocean one day doing some deep swimming and found myself nose to nose with a 15 footer and, and uh, wasn't like that at all. You know, it wasn't wasn't anything like like what the terror I'd experienced when confronted by these things. And um, so, you know, there's this whole aspect of, of exposure to these things that, that goes beyond just being technical, you know, um, you know, it, it's 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 a real challenge to do this work in the field, getting close to them. And uh, um, I think I think Avi and those guys are going to find this out a lot. This new generation of science is starting to work its way into the field. Um, they're going to learn there's a rabbit hole and that we've all been looking into it for a while now. The, the ground observations are related to the pilot observations. Pilots see what ground observers see. Um, um, abductee type experiences are related to the ground observer situation. And, and, and eventually, you know, you end up in this loop of, of, of a spectrum of experiences that are related to UAP and they're going to find themselves moving into that. It's a multidisciplinary area, uh, not to mention a tactical problem, in my opinion, um, could be. Yeah. Um, I'm going to throw, I'd like to throw out kind of a philosophical question to both of you um, here, I'd like to hear both of your answers. And that is, uh, if indeed the universe is teeming with life, like Mark said, you know, toward the beginning of this show, uh, why, why, if, and if indeed we are being visited by extraterrestrial, why would we be so special? I don't know that, that they want to visit us if there's so much life out there. Either one of you want to answer that first? I, sure. I, I, you want to go first, Ted? Because I have either way. Go ahead, Mark. Okay, thank you. I one of the things that uh, I say is look at the the chemical composition of the universe. All right, you look at the most prevalent atoms in the universe. Now, why would they talk about atoms? When questions about yeah. life. Okay. Well, the question really comes down to the fact that the Earth and all the life on it is carbon based. All the life on the Earth has DNA deoxyribonucleic acid, okay? And, and those nucleotides that make up DNA are made up in special ways depending on what you are, what creature you are. All right. Well, um, any life form elsewhere is going to look for life like itself, most likely. That's an assumption. But they only know what they are like we only know what we are. We're looking for carbon-based life. Every NASA mission, okay, to Mars, for instance, has had as one of its bases find other life forms like us, okay, Micro microscopic, microbial, whatever. But that's the that's the mission, okay. Considering that's true, also consider that carbon-based life forms require oxygen to turn uh, that it turn to to get their energy, okay. They need oxygen, so there'll be some type of uh, respiratory system that uses oxygen, right? And so, therefore, any alien species that's carbon based most likely is going to use oxygen. So, what are they going to do? They're going to look, look for it. That have oxygen in their atmospheres. And guess what? I know Stephen Hawking said that we should hide from the aliens and keep a low profile. But guess what? Two billion years ago, oxygen was building up in our, our atmosphere because of phytoplankton in the ocean. Okay? They build right. the oxygen. Man. So what's that doing? It means that we've been announcing to the universe for two billion, billion. With a billion years. And guess what? It's a blue light. Yeah, Carl Sagan said it's the pale blue dot is what the Earth is. <laughs> the fact is, we aren't so pale. If you're an advanced species, we stand out like a blue beacon of, of wowza, okay? Mm -hmm. And so alien species are going to say, hey, look at that. They have oxygen. Let's go see. If they have the capability, they're going to come. And you got to remember that we're broadcasting that in all directions. The light from yeah. our planet is going everywhere. Mm -hmm. So alien I like the answer. Thank you. All right, uh, Ted, you, did you want to add to that, Ted, or do you have your own thoughts? Well, well sure. You know, the original question is, why would they come here? Um, you know, Avi, well, I think probably one of the most significant contributions that Avi made was his paper on um, uh, the ambient temperature of the universe during its earliest epoch. And he, he estimated that 
a few hundred years, a hundred thousand years after the Big Bang, the ambient temperature of the universe was 73 degrees. And given that heat, you know, that's energy, right? That's that's all part of the life process. That's why life is created in zones around stars right now, because it's cold out there, you know, and if you want chemistry to happen, you need it warmer. And and so that metabolism and all these things can take place, like Mark was saying. Um, so first off, there's plenty of time for a saturation of the universe in terms of um, life and intelligent life and technically enhanced uh civilizations. Uh, Dr. Kaku, Dr. Michu Kaku applied the Kardashev scale to interstellar travel, you know, and he suggested that, that you know, uh, it, we could break down our understanding of the capacity of a civilization by its ability to travel much the same way Kardashev suggested that we could break down the way how powerful a civilization was by its, the size of its radio signals um, and the ability to generate the energy to make those signals. Um, so, the uh, what we're looking at, you know, I mean, for them to make these transits here from wherever they come from, um, you know, just assuming all things are equal and that's what, what's going on here. And I'm not delusional and everything's kind of what we think it is um, to, to make those transits at, at light speed is is really, really doesn't work. You know what I mean? It, 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 it takes a long, long time. Generational ships, this kind of thing. So you need a warp capacity to begin with. And we're learning that warp is possible, likely. Very good. Um, right. And uh, uh, so what we're looking at is if, if we are looking at a civilization that's here, it's probably a cusp class two, class three civilization that's capable of, um, general, of exploiting general relativistic principles and transits. Um, and it's probably got a very ad advanced materials engineering manufacturing process. It's probably got a very in the know um, nanotechnological system. I mean, and I'll just just add that, you know, my own observation of one device that I saw the interior of that, that there was nothing in there except the crew. I mean, it, 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 everything was in the whole of the device is my guess. It, it was a very simple thing. Um, can you Run describe that a little in that. more detail, Ted? Well, Ted, it was a cylinder. Mind describing that? Yeah, I, I, I can do that. You I guess. said it, you it saw was these. Was this, was this like a window you were looking through? Let, let's let's yeah. hear a little bit more about it. If you well, want. What, what it was was a cylinder, and it was transparent on one side. You couldn't see through it, but you could see into it. They had a deck. Um, there were three crewmen standing in the middle of it with their hands on a panel and a heads-up display, and they were facing us, so the device was broadside. It had jumped from a mile away and come to a dead stop in front of our car faster than I could blink. I was looking right at it. If I hadn't been looking at it, I wouldn't have seen it when it happened. And so it just goes whack and stops right in front of the car and then matches our speed down the road. And so I get this whole broadside interior cross section of this thing. And I could see the deck they were standing on. There was a void underneath it. Um, and there was nothing in there. There was no chairs. There was no anything. So, and, and again, you what know, did that they look like? Well, they didn't look like, look like us. They had big light bulb shaped heads, little skinny bodies. Um, but the thing about it is, is that, that um, there, there was a lot of physics in that, that experience. So there was a lot I could see that happened that now I've spent 20 years studying the field. I know how to talk about it, you know, so that it's interesting, right? It's appropriate. We, um, I got a hunch they don't use a lot of energy to do what they do, even though in our calculations, we would, we would imagine that they would need it. Um, their um, everything about their systems looks different, you know, in, in terms of how they function. And we're going to find that out, you know, and again, because they don't fly like anything that we know flies. They don't fly like a ballistically, like a bow and arrow. They don't fly um, like, like a, 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 an aerostat or a lighter and air object. They don't, they don't fly like an airplane. Right. So we've got this whole other thing. What are they doing? And it's, uh, if they can make angular turns at speed, if they can come to sudden stops from speed with very sudden decelerations, this kind of thing, then we're looking at something very different. Um, the case that Dr. Knuth took down was uh, 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 a document documentation of a device that went from 28,000 feet to 50 feet in 0.78 seconds. And the it's argument like was about, you know, uh, yeah, huge G's and kinetic energy. There should have been a ripe explosion at the end of that, you know, tons of TNT, 
as that thing throws off the kinetic energy, which didn't happen. Um, yeah. So all of these the are clues that tell us. Go ahead. No, I'm just saying that's the same thing with no sonic boom, no splash in the water. Uh, all how, how about ripping through the atmosphere but leaving no plasma trail, no no ionization the way a meteor would? Um, right. You know, a meteor's doing 40,000 miles an hour when it hits the upper atmosphere. What's it do? It ionization by impact. Yeah. 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 You know, these don't do that. Um, yeah. So there's a lot of clues in all of this that, that we can look at and say, well, hmm, you know, and, and what I share in terms of my own observations, that's it's already visible in all the other cases. I'm just I'm just offering it because people need to get used to the idea of people like me who've seen these things who are who are talking about them in a rational way, you know. At, um, and you had you had two other uh, witnesses with you that day, too, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I wasn't driving. You know, I was in the okay. car and uh, uh, when when the thing this is the temporal effect I was talking about, Mark, um, when the thing pulled up to the car, it was about 430 in the afternoon. It was about 15 feet in front of the vehicle and just above. We could see under it to see the road. Sue refused to stop the car. The, the thing pulled over to one side on us and right in this zone, right about here. It went from 430 and even we traveled about 90 seconds, about a mile and a half, and it was 734. And she didn't stop driving. We didn't leave the road. It was very disorienting. You know, it was like a very sounds weird like a moment. Time. Sounds like a missing time episode. Kind of well, it, it's, it's accelerated time. You know, it, it was th there's a boundary zone between them and us. If you get too close to it, it changes your relationship to your frame. I understand that. I might, and and the, I, the only thing I, I might disagree with you on one thing that you mm -hmm. made it. I'll talk about this too, but um, sure. you said that they don't, you know, it doesn't appear like they use a lot of energy. I actually kind of think it's just the opposite. They have actually secured a way to use limitless energy provided by the universe itself. And thus they, it's incorporated into their systems, which looks simple to, to you and to us that might see them uh, say nothing inside or whatever, no visible means of propulsion, et cetera. Right. But we are only 5,000 years into keeping our actual history, like from Sumeria on forward, right? We don't know. It, we already see ways to use the Alcubierre drive that you were referencing earlier, the warp drive, right. or the nearest star, in perhaps one to two weeks if we go right. at a proper speed. It will actually be a, a variant of the uh, the Froning Alcubierre variant that would actually allow us to get there safely without sloughing off, as you say, when, when, you know, when we have right. the kinetic energy, uh, when we stop, a lot of energy built up on our windshield, kind of like bugs on a the windshield. They're going to have to go somewhere, and it's coming off as terms of energy that would obliterate the very solar system we were trying to enter. So we have to use a different way to kind of slough that energy past us and let the bugs mm -hmm. pass on the way through that little gap that we cross. Um, but that's, that's the only thing I, I have an issue with there. But and, and So everything else, it stands to reason, and it's worth investigating. To, to you know generate proofs of right i mean you know it's all speculation until we have a, a, this darn ship in front of us and we can say hey ted can you take that apart i'll stand over here behind the shield <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well you know and that's the funny thing i don't need anybody to believe me okay and it, it, my story isn't really anything other than it, it, it's to inform from the side you know just to say hey you know don't discount this this is part of the general data set, you know, um, I, I know that in the end, reality and research and good science is going to resolve what this is. And either I'm right or I'm not. And I, I, I don't have an investment in it. I've never made any money at this. I'm just trying to understand why these things have happened to people and to me and um, and to understand what the nature of all this really implies. Uh, and it was really hard sitting there in this group of engineers <laughs> and uh, listening to all of this, these ideas that they had, and they had many uh, good ones. Um, I, I, but, but it was all about how, the, how this was happening. And I just wanted to scream, you do care about why, you know, <laughs> why is this happening? You know, and, and because, you know, the nerds, they get focused down into, into their, you know, their, their particular corner and the, the big picture issues just kind of go by because that's what they do. They focus. And, and, you know, that conversation's happening somewhere else. I don't have any doubt about that, but, but, um, but, as somebody who came to this as an experience first and then became a researcher and then started carrying the torch a little bit to get this ball turning, you know, um, 
you know, I, I personally would like to see a little bit of focus on that. I, it, it, and and that, I think that comes from just trauma from my own experiences with them and wanting to see something happen. You know, Ron Neary from Close Encounters got nothing on me. Nothing. You know, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's funny. Um, I, I agree with that. I, I think that um, I think that the concepts of how they travel or whatever. I mean, I, I like the concept that Miguel Alcubierre came up with uh, because, you know, if you have like uh, a paper, right, you know, and you're going from this corner to this corner, uh, if we if we just measure that length, that's a long distance, right, on this cloth. Right. But if we hold space and just do this and bring those points right next to each other, then we just have to cross a little tiny gap effectively and then unfold. Right. Space. Now we're there without crossing the intervening space. Mm -hmm. So that process is something that was right. It was just a, a thought problem. Everybody said, wow, cool, Miguel. <laughs> we'll put it on the shelf because we can't do it. But then uh, uh, Harold, Sonny White, right, down at uh, yeah. Eagle Works Labs when he was working right. there, he, he reformulated the shape of the ship, basically, the, 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 the toroid, that would actually right. make this warp bubble that the ship needed. And previously, it needed, like, the energy equivalent of converting the mass of Jupiter to energy, which, of course, is ridiculously, colossally, stupendously impossible for right. even an advanced civilization, probably. But in working it, he figured out that he could do this with something more like the size of, say, like the Voyager spacecraft, convert it to energy. And that's why NASA's funded research to look into this possibility. It won't be yeah. ready now. Or it won't be no. ready in 100 years, but maybe in three or 400, 500 We'll have a Coke bottle sized probe that can go to Alpha Centauri, you know, and that's just the start, right? I mean, that's there's right. out there that are maybe 10,000 years, a million years, a billion years ahead of us or more. What do they look like? You know, what do they, exactly. look like? you know, and, and how do they interact with the universe? Are how do they, they get there? How do they get there? How are they? Are they one with the universe? Are they like part of the fabric of the universe? Uh, are they, I, I did this uh, talk in Denver years ago. Uh, are they part of the the visiting species, perhaps, that are responsible for having every religious deity on the planet Earth <clears throat> and all the various cultures be shown with halos? Okay, the the Wanjana have halos. That's Australia. Yeah. That yeah. Halos. Okay, five thousand years ago, that was put on their cave walls and picto pictographs. Okay. Valcomonica aliens, are they helmeted warriors or are those halos? You know, every single Renaissance painting showing our, our deities, uh, we've got, you know, halos around the deities. Where did the halo come from? And my, my view is it had to be observed. It was probably observed and then recorded, wow. right. right? So if that's right. the case, now we're talking about visitation from more than one group potentially. And Could be. As I said, we are an oxygen blazing blue ball. We're not a pale blue dot. We're a blazing blue ball. Yeah, and we that, stick out like a sore thumb, no doubt. Yeah, like thumb, yeah, like I said, and I think that we are a signal to every other carbon-based life form in the universe. Hey, go there. That's where the party is. Look, there's <laughs> creatures here we can study. You know, well, the, the, thing, the, thing about this, yeah. so, the thing about this, though, Mark, is that there are so many of these blue balls now. I you know, it, it, our extrasolar planetary searches are revealing the high density of water-bearing planets and, and moons everywhere. Yes, um, we, we have to be careful about water-bearing planets because we don't really know for sure yet. When the James Webb yeah. Space gets up there, it'll be able to infer an oxygen atmosphere. It can't observe it directly because oxygen is actually in the visible spectrum. It's, sig it's, it's spectral signatures. But carbon dioxide, methane, and other... Uh, signatures are in the infrared part of the spectrum, and this will allow us to infer based on the, the quantities of each whether there's oxygen there or not. Mm -hmm. um, but certainly, a civilization that's advanced will have figured out a way to look directly at a planet and say, Hey, is there oxygen in this atmosphere? And if the answer is yes, it'll say, Ooh, how much can we survive there? Well, you got to think, okay, uh, a planet like ours, uh, here's the thing that's so cool a planet like ours is one that's, that's, that's not in equilibrium. We'd like to think we're in equilibrium, you know, and I know people talk about climate change, all that stuff. That's not this. We have more oxygen in our atmosphere than should be there. The oxygen is there and thus so are we, but it's a disequilibrium process. 
there's more oxygen being pumped into the atmosphere and made by something. And an alien civilization is going to know that because they know that oxygen right. in an atmosphere of a regular planet is going to get absorbed into the rock strata and become, you know, uh, you know, uh, uh, other compounds that, that bond with oxygen, like Mars. Okay, Mars lost its oxygen for you know billions of years ago to uh, the iron compounds in the soil for a whole bunch of reasons. But those the oxygen went into the soil and it became uh, various forms of hematite, basically rust. Mm -hmm. And Mars, mm -hmm. that's why it's red. Hey, right. see if you didn't, right. you do it. Iron oxide. Yeah. So the point being, this this oxygen, if it's in this copious amount. Aliens are going to know, extraterrestrial species are going to know that it's because it's out of equilibrium, which means something's pumping oxygen, which means maybe it's a process or maybe it's life. Right, right. And that's the thing that matters most of all, I think, to a species looking for another world that has life that is, well, existent, number one, and right. possibly like them, number two. We look what, like we do because of our specialized you know, path through evolution. And all the five major extinction events we had here, of course. So that said, that's why we look the way we do. We can't bet for one second that another species is going to have the same kind of situation. Uh, they might be on a tightly locked planet, which is going around their star, facing the, the star, uh, like a small star, slightly bigger than Jupiter. Okay, and it, it'd be so more many variables. Yeah, that's right. the, the yeah. M class, right? The very low temperature stars. And there's so many variables, as you said, Martin, you know, that, that we don't know what to expect when we get out there, but we also don't know what to expect for life. We right. don't know what we see as grays. Maybe those are maybe those are creatures that uh, come from one of these M-class dwarfs, these red stars. So they have big eyes to be able to see in the dimmer light. Right. Okay. That's right. Gray More gravity, skinnier bodies, yeah, um, right. all of that. Yeah. yeah. All um, that. Part, we got to. Go ahead. Sorry about that. Uh, Mark, I, I don't want to forget to talk to you about your series that um, I uh, a friend of mine uh, watched you in called Alien Invasion. It was great. But we do have a caller right now. Jeff is calling from Indiana. Jeff, you're on the air. Welcome to the show. Hi, Jeff. Hey, Jeff. I'll say that one more time. We have Jeff from Indiana on the line. Jeff, you're live. Welcome to the show. Yeah, thank you very much. <clears throat> I just want to say I'm with Ted. I'm an experiencer. When you've seen it, yeah. Hello, can ahead. you hear me now? Yeah, we yeah, can hear we're you. Hearing you. Yeah. <clears throat> All right. Well, hey, thanks for the call. I, I, I we don't know if you're having up a... anyway. Yeah, when you when you when you've seen this and you're in a conversation with people who haven't, it's really a bummer. Yes, it is. Um, if, you're, if you happen, if you if you happen, Jeff, if you happen to be running your program uh, that you're listening to the show, uh, please uh, please get out of that. Please cancel it. Please mute it. Whatever you need to do. If you happen to be listening to that, you want to listen to us. We're live. You're live on the air right now. All right. So, thank you, Jeff. Uh, anyway, the line oh, is open. Okay. And uh, uh, I'm sorry, Jeff, the line is open and that number is 855-472-5483. Uh, Don't you love live radio? Uh, it is a challenge. So, yeah. You so said I, I do want to go ahead, Mark. What were you going to say? <laughs> this is Martin's show and we're like taking over, Ted. What the heck? You know, we got to stop this. <laughs> <That's all right. laughs> I'm enjoying the heck out of it. Yeah. I'm enjoying it very much. But Ted mentioned earlier, okay, was something that I wanted to pursue a little bit. Yes, I got it down. You know? yeah. yeah, I hit him right there. Yeah, you have to do um, everything backwards. Yeah. When we talked about when we talked about um, you know, alien species around, say, another planet, looking different than us, right? Um, you know, there's rumors of other kinds of creatures, right, that have been seen. And you know, I I have never been a fan of the people that say that there's all these types of creatures that exist out there and you know, the Nordics, the reptilians, all that stuff. Um, but I have to say that if the dinosaurs didn't die in the KT boundary event, the Chicxulub right. meet asteroid strike, okay, if they didn't yeah. get wiped out over the intervening time, the months after the strike, 
Um, what would have happened? There was one theropod meat eater that was actually gaining a, a, tr a fairly significant cranial capacity when mm -hmm. he was wiped out. Would that dinosaur have become intelligent? We certainly can't say no, but we certainly can't say yes. But you think about that, and you think, well, what if the fact that there were dinosaurs here, is that a consequence of the way carbon-based life evolves on a planet kind of like ours? Would there be dinosaurs elsewhere? Or some version of dinosaurs elsewhere. Don't know. But if there is, then maybe the people that say there are, and I, like I said, I, I, I always refrain from saying this because it makes you sound like a nutcase, right? If there are people that say there's reptilians out there, I guess I could imagine a species that may have had a similar event but didn't have the killing off of their sure. dinosaur at some point. And again, dinosaurs are a consequence of a variety of you know events here on this mm -hmm. planet. No guarantee would happen elsewhere, right? But if they did, I could imagine that there could be a species like that, you know. And <clears throat> me, as far as your experience, you had you had the experience you talked about, Ted, right? right? Well, I had missing time as a kid. I lost an mm -hmm. entire day, and I still had my bag lunch from this field trip I was supposed to go on with my school, and I was sitting back on the bus with it and. Everybody said, where were you all day? And I was like, well, when are we going to get to the pond? And, of course, I got called every name in the book. You, Jack, we've already been to the pond. Okay, then <clears throat> I had something shoved up my sinus, all right, which uh, was a very, very strange thing. It was something that made me immobile, and I saw it coming in, and I couldn't move my eyes to look at it. I was sort of in that, like, nip the pompic state, you know, where you're kind of in the netherworld. Mm -hmm. To meditate actually when I want to because it's a really nice feeling. Well, I ended up the, watching this thing move this wand type thing, look like a actually imagine an illuminated big pen, okay, white moving back and forth in front of my face. And then next thing you know, it was morning, uh, and I was literally lying in my own blood, uh, face down, all right, actually drowning almost in my own blood. So, this and you know, going to a surgeon after they took it out and he said, that's the biggest thing I've ever seen in someone's nose. I don't even know what to tell you. He said, we're going to send it to pathology. I'll give you an answer in a week. Okay. And he and he and and I said to him, can those things seed around like a foreign object in someone's nose? And he said, well, yeah. You mean like a metal splinter from a machinist? I go, yeah. He goes, yeah, they can. Why? Well, I explained the, the terrifying events that I had, which actually forced me to leave the previous house, actually. It was really terrifying. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, when when uh, he said that, um, I said, oh, I know it's not aliens. I am sure it's not alien things. And he goes, yeah, of course not. Well, uh, I called him in a week. And I when I answer, when the, the secretary answered the phone, she goes, oh, hello, it's doctor. Uh, hello, yeah, it's Mark D'Antonio. Oh, no, hold on, doctor has to talk to you. I'm like, oh, no, it's like head cancer or something like that. My head's going to fall off. <laughs> he gets on the phone and he goes, yeah, no worries. Uh, it's probably benign not to worry about it. Oh, okay. So you didn't get probably. Any... You said it was probably benign. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> and I yes, that knows. Okay. And I said, yeah, uh, okay, benign. But so you don't have the results. He goes, well, <clears throat> that's a little bit of a mystery because, for the, and they, no lie, exact phrase. For the first time in the history of this office, the pathology office down below, downstairs, said that they can't find the sample. It's gone. It crawled off. Well, I don't know if it crawled off, but I do know that it's it's probably been, you know, taken somewhere. Could be Whether recovered. True or not. Well, or or somebody from Washington came to get it. And the reason I think that was it was because a few years later, I had to go back to him for something else. And, you know, I, I had done a lot of special work for the Navy. I still do. Well, I wrote on there that I do special projects for the Navy with my company. Okay. And he came in and he says, oh, special projects, huh? And I detailed one of the two of the things that I could talk about with him. And, and he told me about one he did as well. And he said, but I just gave up my top secret clearance this year. What? What are you operating on? Top secret giant polyps in people's sinuses or that kind of thing? And he laughed it off. He goes, no, no, no. I was not always a surgeon, he said. And he got really serious about that. And, oh, and he proceeded to tell me about this event. He worked on Project Starfish. Do you remember that one? Oh, no, no. Nuclear weapon in the stratosphere. 
Oh. Sea oh. Does. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, that wasn't exactly true. Uh, he said they used it to take down a satellite. His words. Okay. And he says, and we were successful. It lit up Honolulu from 1,600 miles away. <laughs> okay. <Good grief. clears throat> yeah. You know, with a flash, an instantaneous flash. Well, anyway, that told me everything because I know what the protocols are, having been in that world. Um, he had to call someone in Washington to say, look, I had a patient, blah, blah, blah. And uh, he says this happened, you know, whether it is or not, I just want to let you know. Okay, thank you. Where's the sample? It's in the pathology office here at the hospital. Okay, thank you. And now you see he has plausible deniability. He really doesn't know right. where it is and where it went. I would, uh, I would very much, I would very much enjoy chatting with you offline. Um, sure. uh, I've got a, got a kind of a similar story to tell you about having things shoved into your face. Um, Don't like that. They hear you. <laughs> yeah, not good. Um, yeah. But there's not, I, that's the thing about all of this. There's, I, I don't, you judge them by what they do or what you experience in the, in the presence of the phenomenon. If you're going to, if you're going to be make, make value judgments on it and, um, and you walk away not feeling terribly good about it uh, in, in terms of what's going on. I, if this is an intelligence, then they have the ability to communicate and they're not. Um, they have the ability to explain themselves and they don't. You know, and people people are subjected to them without choice, right? All creatures have boundaries. Our emotions are based on managing our boundaries. Our diplomacy is based on managing our boundaries. You know, a lot of the a lot of the words we have are so that we can manage our boundaries, yeah. right? And they they don't care about our boundaries. Yeah. You know, if, if, if yeah. it's what I think it is. We don't care about the boundaries of elk. Well, it, it's it's. it's you know, it's it's we're thinking in human terms. Who knows how they think? You know, I mean, that's a, exactly. We can't, we can't assign know. our morality to them either. That's the question. That's a big thing. Yeah, we can't yeah. say that they feel moral obligations not to hurt us. They may not have any such thing. That's 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 projection of human emotions and what, what right. we have though. What we have though is a responsibility to call it what it is and protect ourselves. Right. And yeah. and. And, you know, whether, you know, I, I swim in the sea, right? You know, I love everything in there. If it tries to bite me, I'm killing it. Okay. It, it, it's, hey, you know, I can't afford to get bit by things bigger than I am. And, and if they try it, I'm going to do everything I can to stop it. When I go out in the forest here, I, I live in Alaska, right? I, 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 I can conceal carry anywhere I go. It's legal. You know, I can have a driver's license in one pocket and a pistol in the other. And, out here, there's nobody there to protect you. It's 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 all on you, and whether you and, and the bears and every other darn thing, you need you need. I use layers. I have a I carry bear spray first, right, and then then it would be a backup of something else. But 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 the idea that you know I, I love all those critters. I never want to hurt them, but I'm not going to let them eat me. You know, <laughs> it's, and if you're you using know, your bear spray. It's already too close to get that pistol ready. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's right. yeah. yeah you gotta have truth. both at the same time. Yeah, Ain't we have a truth. Gasper. We have Gasper. Uh, yes, it's Gasper from California. You are live on the air. Welcome Hi, Martin, show. and Hi. Um, everyone. I, I only got a little piece of um, a Professor Avi's interview. I want to look back and watch more of it. But one question I have, and one I would ask him, is what happens if he does find indisputable proof or really good evidence? That I, I really can answer that. I can answer that because I did talk to him about that. Um, okay. He is, uh, this is not going to be government. Um, it's not going to have any connection to this at all. This is all. Um, he wants this completely transparent. He wants uh, people to be able to access this, access the feed. He doesn't want to hide anything. He wants this, you know, to be completely, like I said, it's completely open to the public. I don't know if either one of you have any more feedback on that. Well, we hope he gets his way. Uh, I know that uh, with UFOTOG that we renamed to the Aerial Anomaly de the Detection System that Doug Trumbull and I are working on, <clears throat> we also said it's going to be uh, free and, you know, humanity owns the data. We don't basically is what we said. We're just gatherers. Uh, and within six weeks of talking about it, uh, Doug got a call from the Defense Department. And they wanted to know 
all the details about what we're doing. And Doug credit basically said, I don't think so. Click. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah. I don't play with that. I Mike. Mean, I'm, the, the reason why I'm asking too, is because, you know, I'm, I'm sure maybe this might have that had something to do with the department of defense or whatever calling you, but you know, you get into a situation where, yes, I think, you know, this information should be to the public. It should be uh, everyone's to hear. But I often wonder, like, what are the ramifications of that? You know, this is a phenomenon I only got into recently. My mom, uh, it was around 1998, and her, my brother and sister, saw something. And my dad and I were not there at the time. This was in Gilbert, Arizona. And it was, you know, classic UFO. It was a, more of a sphere, I think she said. And I completely dismissed her whole account, you know, for, you know, since that time period. I remember when she brought it up, my dad and I just kind of ridiculed and made fun of her. And she, my brother and sister, just kept quiet about this incident that happened. And it wasn't until the Nimitz incident and the, you know, the press that it got in the New York times where, you know, I was like, huh, maybe there is something to this phenomenon. And I asked her after all those years, you know, you know, I asked her to relay the, the, the story back to me. And she said, you know, it's clear as day, 12 in the afternoon, I'm standing in the backyard with your brother and sister and this thing, not even a thousand feet in the air. It was just right above them, almost like looking at them. And out, out of curiosity, because my brother and my mother, they had a falling out. I called him separately and I asked him the details of that day and, and the shape of it, how you know fast it was. Because she said it had left. She said it only hovered for about two or three minutes and then it shot straight up into the air like a gun. It was gone in about a second. All these details, after all those years, it was very real. And for me, a person that didn't believe in any of this stuff, I was like shook to the core. And so sometimes I feel like, you know, yes, I want to hear the data, but how many people out there are really ready to find out if this is extraterrestrial and are able to handle that kind of truth. Like I, I sometimes wonder, is this the reason why stuff is being kept from us is because that is one of the concerns and it's a variable that the government is taking into account. Like, look, we, you know, we're observing these things, but we don't know much about it other than it's real. And a lot of people are going to have these questions and, I'm assuming if uh, Professor Loeb or Mark, you know, you know, or Ted or anyone gets a hold of footage or real evidence, they're going to be asked those questions of like, where'd they come from? Why is this here? You know, it, it, it's just something I, 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 I think about, like, are, are we ready? Yeah. Ted, you you look like you got to say something there. I saw that. that like, yeah, I got to say something. <laughs> yeah. You know, Gasper, I, I think a lot about this because I'm not um, a PhD. Um, I'm not a physicist. I'm, I'm, I was first an administrator. And before that, I was an experiencer. And now I'm a researcher and have been for 20 years. So I've learned a bit of all of that, worn a lot of hats. Uh, but the things that I lose sleep over are exactly what you're talking about. On one hand, we want transparency, and we argued for that when we spoke to the AIAA, um, that, that it's very important. The data should be in a, a public repository where it can be examined and replicated or or built upon or debunked. And, uh, uh, and that, you know, all of that should be in the public domain. But at the same time, the question is, you know, there are a lot of underserved populations because of institutional bias around this subject. I have pilots and air controllers, but, but think of psychologists and their patients. Think of uh, other, other types of relationships where uh, the professional attitude of this can't be happening obstructs the care that people need who, who it's happening to. And, and then I think about there are a lot of people out there that really can't handle this. There, there's a... Uh, um, there are a lot of people with psychological issues and so on. And, and uh, this is a kind of thing that just becomes almost something they can't, they can't cope with. So I, I just think that, that, that perhaps 
Um, you're right, Gaspar, with your concerns. I, I, uh, I, I, I don't know really how it goes because, you know, imagine you've got despots that are going to claim they're in the favor of the aliens, right? And it's all going their way. And you've got, uh, do countries have the right to keep uh, UFO data to themselves uh, when, it, when it implicates the entire world? Um, you know, any more than they have the right to keep, you know, pandemic information to themselves. You know, is there a, you know, you know, there, there are a number of things with this that, that, that you're exactly right. It, it's a much bigger picture than simply deciding that we're going to study something that we've ridiculed for 50 years. And then, yes, but I'll tell you this, too, from my perspective, um, you can imagine you know, as a science guy, OK, when I see something that doesn't match my science, um, I could go down one of two paths. I could go down the path that says, well, I just must not understand what's going on here. It's probably something uh, ordinary that I'm mistaken and then dismiss it. I get that a lot. People do that. On the other hand, I could say, hmm, this might be something more than it appears to be. I'm going to have an open mind. I'm going to try and investigate it. And that's the path I took ever since I was nine years old, actually. So I really, I really feel that that's important. I know that the that countries do, as, as, as Ted was saying, countries do segregate data and keep it from the others. I know that because um, I've had experiences with this working uh, for the Navy and so forth. Uh, I went to Siena Sub, and Martin knows the story. Um, and I'm not going to go through the whole thing, but basically something was seen on board the sub, and um, it was an object moving through the sonar, very, very brief, and the sonar tech reported it to the executive officer as moving several hundred knots underwater. Now, that's... Per hour, yeah. Several hundred knots, yeah. Per hour, yeah. Well, it didn't move knots. several hundred knots. It moved several hundred knots per hour. No, knots are a velocity. Oh, so, my God. I've been, on, I've been on the ocean for years, and I didn't know. <laughs> we won't tell anybody. Sorry. Gasper, don't tell him. Just, just between us four. I agree. Port's right and starboard's left, right? No. Yeah. All right. I know. Uh, just just keep in mind, though, we do have um, we do have one more caller. I'd like to squeeze him in. But go ahead. Wrap that up, if you would. Yeah, okay. So I was just saying that you know, science, um, you know, seeing things that didn't match my science and then uh, seeing that thing on the boat was incredible. And then talking to one of the joint chiefs when I had to do a project for him down in Washington. Uh, and I asked him about this program called the fast mover program. Cause that's what they call it on the boat. Uh, he said to me, I can't talk about the program. I'm sorry. Whoa. <laughs> that was by the way, decades before the Nimitz incident, just so you know. Yeah. yeah. So I feel like I could go another two hours because I have <laughs> many questions for both of the, both of you here. Um, but anyway, let's uh, let's try to get. Thank you very much for the call, there, Gasper. And now we have Stephen on the line from Michigan. Stephen, you're live on the air. Uh, Mr. Willis, thank you for what you do, and and to Ted and Mark, thank, thank you. you for this conversation. I'll make my uh, question uh, quick and concise. Um, in regards to to public safety, um, I'm just curious as to, and feel free to speculate. Um, these these encounters, I've there are multiple stories where. Either encounters are awe-inspiring and benevolent, the aerial phenomenon, uh, messages being sent um, with uh, uh, concern for the planet and, and humans. But then you also hear stories of abductions and um, things done to us without our consent. And so I guess my question is, if you had to speculate and if you had to guess, um, do these things lie more on the benevolent side or the malevolent side, or is this a 50 shades of gray? Some are good, some are bad, but I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. And thank you for all that you do. Well, thank, thank you very you. much, uh, Stephen. I, I'll just really quick, I'll throw this in. I just, uh, well, a, a, a documentary, two hour documentary that, uh, me, Ben Hansen and Melissa Tittle just worked on in the Hudson Valley was called alien invasion, Hudson Valley. It was great. Uh, yeah, thank you, Martin. And the thing is, um, we went there thinking we're going to try and find out what's going on in the Hudson Valley. It turned out we ended up going there to find answers for all the many people that actually felt they had had encounters of all different kinds. Okay, the the investigation was focused on the town of Pinebush, 
And if you're in the area, September 4th, Pine Bush has a wonderful UFO fair. I'll be speaking there. Lee Spiegel will be there. Richard Dolan will be there. And we'll all be talking. It's going to be Martin a- Willis will be there. Martin yeah. Willis, that guy, yeah, right there. That guy right there. He's going to be there. Yes. <laughs> um, and, um, but the point is that it wasn't supposed to be a, a, like a commercial there. I was just trying to say <laughs> the people in Pine Bush have been terrorized and terrified by things that have gone on there. How about this? 3,000 cases there in the last 10 years. 3,000. Amazing. And they're not reporting every bird that they photograph badly. They're talking about town wide things that happen. Many people looking in the sky, people with witnesses saying, What is that? Holy cow, it's got these lights. What's it doing? And why do they have lights? We don't even know. It's probably a consequence of their propulsion, for all we know. So a lot of things going on. And 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 Pine Bush seems to be the center. It's the UFO capital of the world. So, you know, these these people would not say it's benevolent. These people, I had people terrified to come out of their home to talk to us. And they basically came out just because we said we're going to get them answers. And they are terrified. So they don't think it's benevolent. They actually think they feel attacked, to be honest with you. Well, I would, yeah. I would add Mark, to that. Something happened. We don't have any time. I'm real sorry to say, but we are totally out of time. So, right. sorry. Uh, and Mark, uh, Mark, I'll see you there in 10 days. And, um, uh, something happened to Mark there. It's on Discovery Plus. Check it out. And Ted, real quickly, how can someone find you online? Narcap.org. Um, you can reach me through the contact us. You can call me. Uh, I want to hear from all of you guys. You know, check in with me, Mark. We've got some notes to compare, I think. Um, and yeah, if anybody. I'll connect you too. Yeah. Uh, right. Uh, and I try to hey. talk to everybody. I answer the phone. So if you call me, I'll, I'll, I'll talk to you. So. All right. Um, thanks. Thanks. We are totally out of time. Thank you both so much. I really had a lot of fun and I'll, I'll send you both on a, a common email to connect you. Take care. Both thank you. you. Thanks. All right. See you, Mark, thank you. In 10 days. Yeah. Okay. Bye. 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 All right. Next week we have Martin Keller on the Penn space club. I'm not sure what that's about, but you have to check it out. It ought to be a fun show. Talk to you next week. And remember to keep your eyes to the sky. Mm-hmm.